Uh, okay, la registrazione, sì, esatto. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, for this uh, uh, second half of today's class, uh, we are going to derive the optimality equation for the discounted setting, okay? So the good news is that uh, uh, if you were not impressed about all the heuristics we've been giving in the last uh, uh, part, uh, doesn't really matter because we start basically from scratch and derive the Bellman's equation uh, uh, from uh, its bare assumptions, okay? So this were, the, the first part was meant as a motivation. Maybe after the fact, you, you will want to go back and uh, uh, understand uh, where it comes from, okay? Uh, so, Let's recap what the, what the problem is. Uh, we want to find out a policy, you know, uh, a single actually, actually policy by AS, uh, which maximizes, so this would be our optimal policy, which maximizes our uh, expectation going from zero to infinity of the discounted rewards, which we can write as usual in this form. And uh, uh, just as we did for the time-dependent Bellman equation, uh, we introduce value functions for a certain policy pi. And so specified the policy, uh, we have the expectation of the same discounted sum the only thing that now it's conditioned on the fact that we start at the initial time at a state s okay so nothing is has changed except for these minor changes uh, about the presence of the horizon and the presence of the discount factor in this uh, uh, in this definition all right, uh, so, <clears throat> and then in a sense, we want to find the, what is the optimal policy, or the optimal value function, this object, which is the one which maximizes overall possible policies, the value function. So once we have obtained this, we know what the best policy is in a way that will be clear in a second. So this is just to recap what the, the task is. So the first step in this derivation, uh, so the step one, is to find a recursion relation. Okay, so this will be very similar uh, to what we uh, uh, did for the time-independent Bellman equation. Uh, so I'm going to go quite, quite quickly on this. Uh, if we start from uh, the value, what we do here, as usually, we split this sum here into two terms. So this is going to be the expectation of the reward for the first step, that is for state S, which is the initial state, action one, state two, okay, which I can say as note as if you wish, so it's even clearer, plus gamma, and then I have the sum from t going to from one to infinity. I pulled out a gamma here explicitly so that this becomes the t minus one. And then I have r st a t s t plus one. Okay, all this is conditioned on s naught equals s. Okay, so very easy step. Separate what is happening now from what is happening from the next step until infinity. And then just going by the same steps that uh, we had last time, we see that this first average can be written as sum over all possible S primes and A. Or again, S node is S, so I have to pick an action from S. Then I have to pick a new state from S and A, and then I have my average reward for the triplet S A S prime. So this is this first expectation value. And the second expectation value is plus gamma. 
and it's absolutely similar in the sense that uh, I pick an action. I'm sorry. Yep. S is S not. Yeah, they and, are the same. Yeah. Okay. And in the, the first equation, uh, it's uh, S Z R of S zero A one and S one. No, no, you're right. You're right. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so the same happens here. We are going to move one step forward. And then in that step, then we get, we see the new value function in the new state as prime. And then when we put everything together here, uh, we, we end up with our recursion relation, which is sum over s prime a of i minus a of Okay, I'm rewriting this here, this object. Now this is a recursion relation which is recurrent, strongly recurrent, because there's no more this feedback structure that there were uh, for times. So you don't have a vector in, at a certain time and then you can derive the vector at the previous time. Now, every state talks to every other state uh, with the same object, okay? But nevertheless, you can solve this equation. It's a linear equation, so you can solve it uh, very simply. It's, uh, uh, it requires just uh, one sweep to be solved uh, explicitly. And this is our starting point. Then the second step is to uh, look step two, look for optimal P, okay, V star, which is the vector of optimal values. That is what you get on average if you follow the optimal policy yet to be discovered. So, <clears throat> Now, the proof of the optimality equation is uh, extremely straightforward. So it's a mathematical proof, so it's very elegant and concise. It doesn't shed a lot of light on what is happening, but we will derive the Bellman's equation in other ways tomorrow in order to see more from the different angles what is happening. But now this proof will just require basically four lines of, com of computation. And it starts out as it should in the sense that the definition of the optimal value is just the maximum over all possible policies of the value of any given policy. Okay. So, uh, and then the next step is nothing but uh, uh, replacing this quantity by the explicit expression that is in the red box above. Okay. So quite uh, not particularly demanding from the intellectual viewpoint. I just copy. <clears throat> okay. Now, in taking the maximum, there are here, of course, a couple of problems because uh, you cannot take the maximum inside simply because there's a sum, so um, you cannot just make it go through. It's a nonlinear operation. Okay, so in order to manipulate these things, we have to do uh, to do something. So the first thing we do uh, is uh, uh, quite obvious in the sense that. By definition, V star is optimal, okay? So for any pi, by definition, let me uh, right here. By definition of V star, we have that P star S is larger equal than V pi S 
for any state S, just because it's a maximum. So using this, I can say that this quantity here, since it has a VPI in here, is a smaller equal than the same thing where here I replace V pi with V star. Do you see what has happened here? This thing here, I replaced with this one because of the property of the maximum. Okay, quite easy so far. <clears throat> Next step is again, relatively simple. We have to look now, what, what, have, what have we gained here from going from here to here? Is that pi has disappeared here. So there's no pi any longer inside. The only pi is here. So second step of this second step, uh, we realize that term in square bracket is linear in pi. So the dependence on the policy of the term over which we maximize now is linear. And therefore, as you remember, we discussed this last time, when you optimize a linear function over a convex set, the maximum takes place on the boundaries. Okay, you, if you remember, we had this very simple example. So let me go back to that for a second. So you maybe it refreshes your memory. Uh, we've been discussing this at the end of last lectures. Okay, so the linearity. And the example was this one in the very simple case in which you have a policy of two actions. This means that it's a linear function, so it can only take values at the boundaries, which in this case are zeros and ones. And the value that it takes is just the maximum between the two coefficients that are in front of this. So the equivalent multidimensional argument here leads us to say that this object here is equal to the maximum over A, and we drop the pi in there. So once again, in the interest of clarity, so we've been using the property of, uh, of optimality of V star to simplify the dependence on the policy of the right hand side, of what is under the maximum operator. The first line on the top has become the third line, and the third line has become the fifth line because of linearity in the policy. Okay. This is very nice, but we have uh, an inequality yet here. Okay. So, and we wish to find an equality. So we have to do a little bit of steps yet. So now next step that we do is that we define, we define arbitrarily a new policy, let's call it pi bar, which is defined as the arc max over A of this last square bracket. Sorry, this the sum here was over S prime, of course. S prime of P of S prime, S K. This is not going to end well, so let me take some more space here. is defined as the arc max over A, and the sum over prime. And then again, I'm copying the last line. Okay, so I am defining a new policy. 
which is was not present at the beginning. Now, what, what is important if, if I choose this, this means that this last line that I have here is also equal to the value of my policy pi bar by definition. Because if my policy is to pick the argument of this, then the maximum is just the value of my policy. Okay, because I use the recursive relation. Okay. So this is just a tautology, it's just by definition. But then if this is true, well, this is one possible policy among many. So again, this has to be suboptimal by definition. So this has to be smaller than V star. Therefore, if you look at this in full, well, you have this here and you have this here at the beginning. This is where we started from. So I don't know if you probably it's not possible to see it in all, but we started from here and then we put series of less than, less than something which is the same thing which we had at the start. So this chain of inequalities basically is our starting thing is less equal than our final thing, which means that they must be equal and everything that is in between must be the same. Right? So as a result of this chain of inequalities, also this object must be equal to this star. So that Putting all things together, we can conclude that V star of S is equal to the maximum over A, sum over S prime, which is the Bellman's optimal equation. And which is nothing but exactly the same thing that we derived heuristically in the first half of today's class. <coughs> so the intuitive solution of the problem, which could have been demonstrated to be true otherwise, is also shown to be valid by this mathematical reason. Of course, if you feel a little bit dizzy about all these inequalities going back and forth, I mean, it's, it's okay, it's perfectly understandable because this is a purely formal proof. We will give, like I said, tomorrow, more concrete proofs of how this, about how this uh, optimality equation emerges, okay? A more, sort of, a little bit more constructive way of, of uh, deriving it. But that's, that's the, uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, this is the Bellman's optimality equation. Now that we have an equation, again, this is a non-linear equation. It, we cannot use dynamic programming, okay? Because we have the same thing on the on the left and on the right, so we have to find out some other way of, <coughs> of solving this equation. But first of all, if we approach this problem mathematically, the first question is: Are there solutions to this equation? Are they unique? So now, what I'm going to do in the next uh, minutes that are left is to uh, derive one result which answers to these three questions altogether. That is, it will tell us that uh, solutions exist, that they are unique, and will give us a method to solve them. Okay? So the following step that we take now is Step three, solving Bellman. Okay, so the, the first thing to notice is that if we reason at a very abstract level, uh, we can write down the Bellman's equation in the following form. So V star 
you can see it as a vector, okay? This star is a vector in R to the cardinality of the state space. Oh, you're frozen again. Hello, hello. I can hear you, but the screen is frozen. Now I cannot hear you. No, well, it's like the freezing came with a little bit of lag. Okay. No, no, you were totally frozen for for a while. Yeah, we, we saw you freezing after that you said, hey, you are frozen, but no, it's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so V star is, you can think of it as a vector in a, uh, in a space which has the dimension of the number of states. And therefore we can write down the Bellman equation in the following formal way, which is, some operator B acting on V star gives back V star. So what this operator is, well, you read it from here. You have to take your vector V star here, you multiply it by gamma, you make a linear combination with the transition probabilities and you add on top of this this other thing. Okay, so it's a combination, and then you take the maximum. So it's a combination of linear and nonlinear operations that returns you another vector. <coughs> and we call this nonlinear operator without much of a imagination, it's the Bellsman operator. Now, what we're going to show here is that this operator B is contracting. What, it, what does it mean to be contracting? It means that it takes uh, pieces of the space of this space where the value functions live. And if you take any pair of points in this space, this operator brings them closer. So it creates, uh, if you apply this operator to a cloud of points, this cloud of points will get closer. <coughs> and then intuitively, this means that if you repeat many times this operation of applying the Bellman operator, this will get you closer and closer and closer. <coughs> Which is the important intuition. Because this will tell you that there exists a solution, which is the center of this contraction. And this solution is unique. This is what is one example of a, a broader concept in mathematics, which is called the fixed point theorem. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> let's move on and try to prove the contractivity of the Bellman's operator. Uh, so again, it's it's quite compact as a as a uh, proof. It works as follows: uh, take two vectors w1 and w2 in this space where the value functions live. A vector which has n, n, as many entries as the as states. Then you ask yourself, so uh, if I apply B to W1 and B to W2, and then I take uh, the norm, okay, according to some, some norm, uh, what is it, okay? So my goal is to show that this distance is smaller than the distance between W1 and W2. So if I take two vectors and I apply the Bellman operators, they after one iteration, they will be closer, okay? That's my goal. How do I go about it? Questions, any questions? Okay. If I go about it, uh, how do I go about it? So let's first replace my definition of the Bellman's operator. This is just copying and pasting the definition, so this is max A of sum over S prime. Uh, 
filters are not to be start, but starting one. <coughs> Minus Okay, so this just follows from the definition and then there is an absolute value outside. Okay, no manipulation here so far. Now, <coughs> remember, we want to show that this is smaller than the initial one. So we want to bound this expression with something that is larger than that. Uh, and the basic idea here is, uh, let me take a short uh, break uh, by using a different color. So what I'm going to want to show here is realize that this is the difference of two maxima, okay? So it's a maximum of a vector minus the maximum of another vector. So I'm going to use, uh, so let's go a little box here. Uh, I'm going to use a very simple inequality. So this very simple inequality, and I'm just going to play around with that a little bit. Uh, so let's suppose we have the maximum over A of the difference of two functions, F and G A. And then if I take this as the, I sum the maximum over G A, this is smaller or equal than the maximum over A of the sum of these two, which is F A. So this is very straightforward to show, okay? Because the maximum of a sum is less than the sum of the maxima. Okay. So recall that the maximum of the sum of two functions, uh, which are different from this, let's say h1 a plus h2 2a, okay? So since every one of these is a smaller equal than the maximum over a of the maximum of each, and then this maximum here doesn't matter any longer, the one outside, this is equal to maximum over a of h a prime plus maximum over a of h a. Two, okay. So the same inequality here. If you use it by changing the names of H one and H two, you get this. And therefore, this tells you that uh, uh, the maximum of yeah, the, the difference of the maxima is smaller than the difference of these two taken in the proper order, okay? So you can use this to bound the absolute value of this, okay? So basically this tells you that maximum A of FA minus maximum A of GA is smaller or equal than the maximum A of FA minus GA, okay? So we're gonna use this here. The difference of maxima, we can sum inside, so algebraic sum of the things that are inside. So take this minus that, this minus that, and therefore be able to write that this object is smaller or equal than the maximum over A of the difference. But when we take the difference, you realize that the first term here is the same. So they kill each other. And therefore, what you get is that this is smaller or equal than gamma times the sum over S prime, P of S prime, S A, W1, S prime minus W2, S prime. This is closed and then there is a, an absolute value outside. Okay. <clears throat>
Now, next step. Okay, excuse me. Yep. But according to the last uh, orange equation, yeah. if I'm uh, uh, solving it, I'm obtaining that the sum of the maximum over A of uh, FA minus GA plus the maximum of GA is greater than. Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm writing here. You're perfectly right, sorry. So that's not what I, I'm writing here. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so let me let me just go quickly through it, see whether if I spot what uh, went wrong in this last step. Uh, oh yeah, because I was wrong in the first. Sorry, sorry, I I copied this thing uh, wrong in the in the very beginning. Apologies. Oof. Apologies. This is this is the statement which derives from this. Okay, so if you recombine, then it's the the first line has the array in the opposite direction. Thank you for pointing that out. I see you are wide and awake, much more much more than me. Very good. So you can you can directly check this uh, uh, separately. Uh, it's just a straightforward calculation. But uh, I was I was wrong in writing down the answer at the, at the top. Very good. All right, so if you if you use this, then uh, we go to the next step, and uh, and then okay, of course there are a few things, few easy things to do. The first one is to pull out the gamma, which is a number, it's just a prefactor. And then the second thing we can do is that so this is uh, uh, every every one of this term here. Is actually smaller equal than the modulus. Okay, so this is again very quite obvious. If it's positive, it's the same. If it's negative, it's less than the absolute value. So we can bound this with the modulus. And of course, if this is positive, then all these the things which are inside the square bracket are also positive. So I can drop out the modulus outside because everything will be positive. And this becomes the sum over S prime, P of S prime, S A, times the modulus of one S prime, two S prime. Okay, very good. Next step. So next step, we are going to introduce uh, the infinity norm, okay, which is a mathematical concept. It's a distance in vector space, which is defined as, or it's also called the total variation distance. It's just the maximum overall S. Which uh, are in the which are in the yes of the modulus of the vectors of the components of the vectors. Okay, so it's a norm. And basically, if you have a vector, you take the absolute values of all the entries, and then you take the maximum of the absolute values. It's not the Euclidean norm, but it's a it's a proper norm. If you think of it geometrically. The Euclidean norm has uh, level lines which are spheres. In this case, the infinity norm has level lines which are squares, okay, cubes, hypercubes. Okay, <clears throat> so if you define this, uh, then you realize that you can bound each of those, each of these terms. These are components of a difference of two vectors, so you can go one step further and say that this is the infinity norm of W1 minus W2 is bounded by this. Because every component must be smaller than the infinite norm in absolute value. Okay. Then uh, now we, we're almost done because now the sum over S prime is acting only on this, 
but this is a probability. So this object gives one. And now the next nice thing is that the maximum over A now is totally vacuous because the dependence on the action has disappeared. So this object is actually equal to gamma, the infinity norm of W1. Okay. So let's look at where we started from. Okay, so this was basically, if I have to write it properly here, so I'm sort of making it uh, even more transparent. This was taken for two different S, okay, because there was still an S around. So this was component by component, okay? You, you see that there was this dependence on S getting over. So, Recap, we have shown that the Bellman operator applied to the vector W1 component S minus the Bellman operator applied to vector W2 component S in modulus is smaller equal than gamma, the infinity norm of W1 minus W2. This is valid for all components. So I can take on both sides, I can take max over S on both sides. And the max over S of what is here is just the same thing because there's no dependence on the, the component. But what this object here is for by definition, the maximum of the modulus of this is just the infinity norm okay and then we're done we're done because now we conclude that if gamma is smaller than one the Bellman operator is contracting And then by the fixed point theorem, we conclude that B V star equals V star has one unique solution. which is again intuitively given by this property of contracting points okay so first take home message uh this ap ap apparently nasty nonlinear equation in fact has rather nice mathematical properties at least when we use the infinite norm okay so we will discuss a little bit if this is really crucial or this is a mathematical artifact I can anticipate that it's mostly for demonstration purposes then uh, we, we, you can you can sort of make it more sensible even with other norms. It's not a necessity, okay? Uh, why, why do we care about this? Well, I mean, it's a good and interesting uh, mathematical property, which uh, we would, we have to cherish because this means that if we find, if we look for an optimal solution of our planning problem, we don't risk ending up in a spurious optimal results. So local maximum, for instance, okay? This is not the case. This has a unique optimal solution, which is not obvious from the, from the outset. Uh, but it's, it's even more interesting than that because this provides us Step four, an algorithm for solution. And this algorithm is called value iteration. 
So what is the area? Well, the area is extremely straightforward. <clears throat> so the pseudocode for this algorithm is the following. Initialization, choose V node. What is V node? It's a guess. It's a guess for your value function, okay? Thanks to the fact that the Bellman operator is contracting, everywhere contracting, it doesn't matter where you start from. Okay, so your initial guess Did you miss any part of the initial guess? The initial guess is arbitrary. Okay. Because it doesn't matter where you start, you will always be converging to the optimal, to the solution. But of course, if you start very far away, it will take a lot. Okay. This is to be expected. So, uh, then you define your next, uh, then there is a loop, which defines your next approximation to the value function as the Bellman operator applied to your previous approximation. Okay, so you start with a guess, you apply the Bellman operator, this produces another vector, and then you repeat this again and again and again until your distance from the new guess to the previous one is smaller than some tolerance. Okay, where you should define this in the infinity norm in order to be able to apply the theorem. Okay, so when the two vectors, the previous one and the new one are close enough in this uh, cubic, uh, hypercubic uh, distance, then you you call it off you say okay i'm happy so you're close enough and then and then you define your optimal approximation to the policy so you're after this step when you're when you're exited so this is return the optimal policy the approximation which is uh as usual a function of Which is defined as the argmax over A of the Bellman operator. So it's S, S prime, S A, R, S A, S prime, plus Okay, so it's the usual thing that I'm rewriting thousands of times all over again. So I'm not, even if you cannot read it well, it's uh, the same object which has appeared many, many times. Okay. And that this algorithm guarantees you that given the tolerance, you are within, you are close to the optimal policy as much as you would. If you decrease the tolerance, you will get even closer. So in a sense, this tends to P star and Phi star. All right, so graphically speaking, just to, to give you the final intuition to what, what is happening here. Uh, so you may think of this being the space of values, okay? So it's, it's not a, a line, it's a, it's a possibly high dimensional space, okay? So this stands for something which should be R to the power number of states, real numbers to the power number of states. So this is the space of values. Now, then there is a function which sends values into values, which is the Bellman operator. So how the Bellman operator, you should think about it as something like, uh, function like this, 
which everywhere has a slope lesser than one. Okay, so this is what the B of V is, like the graph of B of V. Everything is, of course, I mean, it, this is just a one dimensional sketch. So be aware that these are maps of vectors into vectors, okay? So, and this axis would be the sort of the, the outcome. So, again, here I, I drew, drew it really horribly, so please let me just have it a little bit better. Uh, otherwise, this is going to be something. It's uh, something like uh, this. All right, and it's non linear, okay? So I'm trying to, to draw something which is at the same time non linear, but not too ugly. So it has, it has to have the, the right properties, something like a curve like this, okay? So what is the solution of the, the Bellman equation? Well, it, it, it is a solution when these two lines. Oh my God, this is awful. Okay, so this is the curve of V prime equals V. And this is BB prime, V prime equals BB, okay? So this object here, this point here, this is V star, which is the solution of B, V star equals V star. The contractivity property is equivalent to, to say that this green curve here has a slope lesser than one. Why is that? Because if I take two points like W1 and W2, what will happen to them? Well, I look at here, and then this will be my the position of my W1 prime and W2 prime, which correspond to this. And you see if, that if the slope is lesser than one, two points which were far apart will become close. So this is the contractivity property. And what does the value iteration algorithm do? Well, you start from one guess, okay? Say you start from, uh, let's use another color. Let's, you start with your guess V nodes. Then you go up, you see, okay, this is sending me to a value which is larger than V node, but because the green curve here is above the white one. So this will send me to V1 here. And then if I apply again the Bellman operator, I will get here and so on and so forth. So you see that this sequence approaches V prime and the same thing happens V star and the same thing happens from the other side. Of course, again, this is one dimensional, but you can take my word that this idea of contracting does the same job in uh, an arbitrary number of dimensions. Okay. So I think that that was uh, quite a lot for today. Uh, in the exercise session, uh, you will see how this value iteration works, okay? But uh, tomorrow, uh, for starters, I will go back to this uh, idea of value iteration and show you a little bit, uh, some intuition about uh, what kind of uh, approximation it produces in a, it's some simple example like the grid world, okay? But that's for uh, for tomorrow. Fine. Any questions? I just wanted to ask you uh, just a little bit uh, above on what you wrote. Okay. Where does the infinite norm of uh, V K plus one minus V K, it needs to be lesser than uh, you said tall. And so uh, I think tolerance. Tolerance. This, is, this is some tolerance that you uh, okay. that you decide at the beginning. Okay, so <clears throat> you you have to decide when to stop. Okay, 
so you basically you decide maybe I want to stop when uh, the difference uh, of my value functions is uh, lesser than a uh, given number. Or you can use actually other things. So, so you can use also the percentage chain. Okay. So you might want to also to choose when this object divided by the norm of VK infinity becomes smaller than something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have different choices uh, depending on if you have an idea of the numerical value that it takes, uh, or if you haven't, you maybe want to use the uh, percentage tolerance. Uh, it's a uh, the substance of the algorithm doesn't change. The performance might might be different, of course. And this requires a little bit of craftsmanship to be, to be tuned. Thank you. So, any other question? Okay. So that's good. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you tomorrow at nine. Okay. Okay. Thank nice. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much.